Welcome to our online Bible study. We're so glad to have you as a part of what has always been one of the favorite parts of the week uh, for me, the chance to be able to engage in Bible study and, and uh, go deeper into the Bible and see its application for all of us in our daily lives. There's a wonderful book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Love in the Time of Cholera, and I've been thinking of that title uh, and applying that to our Bible study. Well, you know, are there Bible studies for uh, Bible study in the time of pandemics? And of course, the Bible is full of lessons and scriptures and stories that are meant for people in times of difficulty and, and trouble. I, I've never weighed it, but my guess is if you were to, to look at my, my Bible, which is 1,500 pages long, my guess is over a thousand of those pages would be God trying to help all of us deal with difficult things uh, in our lives. Now, our church Bible study, uh, beginning just before Lent, was focusing on the Gospel of John, and we may return to that in a week or two. Uh, our plan was to go through uh, some of the scriptures in the Gospel of John that uh, are not in the other Gospels. And so we began in John chapter 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we had exciting discussions about the Incarnation and Trinity right off the bat. Uh, then uh, the next week or so we looked at uh, perhaps the most famous New Testament verse in the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And the last Bible study we had before things got shut down was John chapter 11, uh, the story of Jesus raising his good friend Lazarus from the dead. It's a very important scripture uh, because we often, uh, around Easter time, rejoice in Jesus' victory over death. But we also recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so it's possible for perhaps people to think, well, resurrection is something that's meant for, for Jesus, but what about us? And so the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead is important because Lazarus is just one of us. It's one of the reasons that whenever Alita and I are doing a, a burial for a family, we often share that story because that's the story of an everyday human being just like you, just like me, and God reaching out and transforming their life with the resurrection into eternal life. But uh, today, Alita and I are together, and I thought we would look at perhaps two of the most popular scriptures in the entire Bible that do help us uh, look at what the scriptures have to say in times of difficulty. Uh, the 23rd Psalm, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Lord's Prayer. So we're gonna start with the 23rd Psalm, and Alita and I often do it as a responsive reading with the congregation. Uh, today she and I will do it, but uh, you can follow along because I'm sure uh, many people know it by heart. So I'll start off and then Alita will respond. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, you hearing this online, I would ask you, what's the, what's the first feeling? What's the first idea, the first concept? Uh, that jumps into your mind, uh, having heard the 23rd Psalm. And now I'll throw that over to Alita and ask her the, the same question, and then I'll offer my thoughts. What jumps out at you from the 23rd Psalm? It's a psalm of such immense comfort, the idea that there is no dark, shadowy place that we go to where we walk alone, and that, that has been captured in so many paintings and songs, uh, whether it's that wonderful uh, old... Um, story about the footsteps and, and looking yeah. back on your life and seeing that in some dark places there were only one set of footsteps and then and then God's voice said that's when I carried you. Um, but I also love that final image that I will dwell in the house of the Lord. There's a, a wonderful hymn setting of this song that, that you know well that uh, says um, that we are like a child at home in God's 
hands. Mm. So I, there's just so much powerful, comforting imagery in this, and it's no wonder that this song has been such a comfort to so many people for so many years. Uh, there's something here for every moment mm. of fear and, and anxiety in our lives. So, And your phrase, there's no dark, shadowy place in life where we are alone. That, that to me is, is why this psalm is such such comfort yeah. and why we turn to it not only in, the, in funerals, uh, but honestly, any time we feel that somebody needs that comforting reassurance of, of God's presence, mm -hmm. this, this is that psalm. What jumps out at me is the, the sense of confidence. Uh, you start right off the bat, the Lord is, is my shepherd. And perhaps, uh, you know, we folks living in, in mostly urban and suburban America in the 21st century uh, aren't familiar with what rural agrarian life or, is like or life for uh, a, a shepherd. And uh, we've, we've discussed this a lot with our office manager, Ronnie, uh, who uh, uh, keeps sheep of her own. She really is a shepherd. <laughs> And uh, the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, uh, I think in modern language, sometimes it has a negative connotation. We say we don't want to be sheep. Sure. But in the scriptural connotation, the idea of the wonderful care provided by the shepherd for the sheep. I think that's why when you jump into the New Testament, uh, Jesus talks about himself as, as the good shepherd. And so when we go through it, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, and as a result of that, I shall not want. I'm going to be led to places of rest, nourishment, restoration. I love that one in particular. We're all looking forward to uh, our souls being revived and restored when the pandemic lifts and we're able to be back out with one another as soon as possible. That will be a, a feeling of restoration. Uh, the promise that we're going to be led in righteous paths, that we're going to be uh, able to choose the right path for for our lives for the living of our daily lives that that's a sense of confidence and of course that last one uh, that um, yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil I mean that is a most most extraordinary promise right there what other thoughts do you have I do also want to, to point to those early verses where it says uh, that he, he leadeth me beside the still waters. That, that sense of, um, as you said, that the shepherd sustains and nourishes the sheep. Uh, to me, that says um, we are always fed when we are hungering and thirsting. And it's very much that the shepherd not only guides the sheep through the dark and scary places, but uh, takes them to the pastures, takes them to the stream. and. Uh, We've talked a lot recently about what we can all do to make sure our spirits are fed. And this is a reminder that, uh, that God is always looking for those ways to feed us too. And we may find our nourishment, obviously not now in physical uh, conversation with people, but in connecting by the phone or whatever it is to remain fed in our spirits. Uh, a lot of people have been reading and praying a lot more. So sure. just remembering that the nourishment of our spirits is as important to God as taking away our fear. Yeah. So. Something else that jumps out at me is all of those verbs that there are in the 23rd Psalm. Uh, maketh, leadeth, restoreth, preparest, anointest, and for those of you who are biblical scholars, you're recognizing that uh, we're using the King James Version of the Bible. And that's because in particular, whenever we're in a congregational setting, a group setting, people really go back to the poetry of the King James Version for those scriptures that they grew up learning by heart. So uh, today, both with the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer, we are using the King James Version. And so we have those verbs as as God maketh, God leadeth, God restoreth, God preparest, and God anointest. Uh, many, many years ago, I was asked to be the Good Friday preacher at an ecumenical gathering in Indiana, Pennsylvania. It always puts a smile on my face because when I booked my ticket, of course, I booked it for Indiana and only to discover that outside of Pittsburgh, there is indeed a, a city called Indiana and uh, they had a very uh, popular, very well attended, something that all the churches bought into, uh, ecumenical Good Friday breakfast. And I was the, I was the guest preacher. And uh, my sermon for that event was, God is a verb. Mm -hmm. 
that when you go through the scriptures, God is constantly active. God is constantly doing. And if you remember English class, probably second grade or third grade, uh, the verb is what carries the action. And the psalmist is telling us that God carries the action in all the ways that can possibly benefit us. And the way that happens, God promises to, to be with us. God also offers, and this is an interesting part of the psalm, the rod and the staff. And again, if you go to a shepherd, uh, you know, depending on what the shepherd has to do to get the sheep's attention, you either use something more gentle like the staff, or sometimes you have to get the sheep's attention with maybe a little more difficulty. And the rod comes out at that point, not necessarily to, to beat the sheep, but to make the sheep clear, no, I need you to go this way and, and not that way. And the psalmist is saying that God seeks to be a part of our life, guiding us in all of the best paths also. And then that idea of anointing us, uh, again, that's not something we're familiar with in Fairfield County, uh, 21st century, but in ancient biblical times, when you entered a home, uh, the idea that the host would anoint you with oil uh, in an abundant way, and how refreshing that was. You and I have had marvelous experiences in India with, with tremendous over-the-top receptions. Uh, almost being buried under mountains of marigolds and, and roses and uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers of India. But it's a way of saying, we are so pleased that you're here. We're so pleased that you're with us. And yet here, God is saying, God is pleased that we're with God. And our heads are anointed as a result. Let's take a look at the Lord's Prayer, and uh, we'll invite everybody online to uh, say it with us, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now that's a part of Jesus' teaching about prayer. And it begins with the disciples saying to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Especially if you go to Luke's version of the instruction on it. The disciples initiate a discussion. And I think that's because even early in Jesus' public ministry, the disciples had seen that Jesus seemed to love prayer and that he would often absent himself uh, from the disciples in order to go off by himself to pray and came back refreshed, renewed, ready for the, for the day ahead. Uh, I know for a lot of people, myself included, one of my major complaints with prayer is I wait till the end of the day to pray and I fall asleep <laughs> mid-prayer. And you know, you think of all the times we've talked about prayer with, with people in our church and they, they always say that's the problem uh, with prayer. So, of course, the number one answer is to find other times <laughs> to pray. But Jesus would spend all day with his disciples, all day with the public, all day with massive crowds, wanting things from him, wanting to be with him, and then go off into the mountains to pray, and then come back and be renewed. And so the disciples were saying, boy, there's, there's going to be a trick to this that we don't know how should we go about our prayer? And Jesus gives a couple of tips, one of which we talked about in our children's message uh, last Sunday uh, with a prayer closet, you know, seeking some place that's peaceful, that's quiet, that's separate from all the other hurly burly of daily life, and you can concentrate on your relationship with God. He also has a wonderful phrase, um, uh, you know, basically don't say a whole lot. Don't think that God is impressed by vain repetitions or just saying something long and long and long and long and long. There's a wonderful story about uh, the boarding school that I attended as a kid. The Northfield Mount Hermon School was founded by a great evangelist, D.L. Moody. And uh, there's a famous story of uh, at the end of one of his revival services, uh, a young preacher was to give the closing prayer. 
And uh, so he goes up to the pulpit and he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays. And finally, D.L. Moody goes up to the pulpit and says, uh, while our young friend continues to pray, uh, why don't we have our final hymn? Uh, so, you know, Jesus was trying to say, don't think that God is impressed either by holy sounding words, you know, we don't have to have all those these and thous in there, or by repetition, you know, as though God can't hear us the first time. Um, but rather, get to the point. And then he gives us the Lord's Prayer as a way to get to the point. And whenever I teach it, I, I hearken back to, again, my days in probably seventh or sixth grade English class in PS 90 and uh, the teachers would teach us how to write proper letters especially business letters <laughs> and the idea was you know you have a nice greeting our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done and then you get to the specific you know give us this day our daily bread forgive us our, our debts you know what are, what are those specifics what are those details that what's the reason for this letter that you're writing and then you close it off again uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory so you know you write a business letter and you say you know i've always thought very highly of your business and, and love your products <laughs> and uh, i'm thinking you know uh, i certainly would love to work for you and and this is what i would hope for and this is what i offer and then close it off by saying you know i think we'd make a, a wonderful team together well i i see that in the lord's prayer what do you see in the lord's prayer well that's I love that imagery. I, for me, it's it's uh, it's not meant to replace our prayer life, right. and, and as you have said, um, but it is something that when words fail us and we need the comfort of something that is familiar and connects us instantly to God, the Lord's Prayer is, is sort of a way that that kind of jump starts your prayer life. Like it's, uh, once you say those words that are so familiar and um, and so ingrained in us, it, it's as if the, the it kind of opens the floodgates and gets you in connection with God. I, don't, I doubt that Jesus meant this is the only prayer you ever need to say, right. or, or even that you have to say it every day, but I think he was saying, here's an example, Here, here's what will get you going. Um, try this prayer and you'll find that you're in conversation with God. So for me, it's a, it's an, it's an opener. It, uh, it starts the process. If you sit down and, and begin with the Lord's Prayer, you find that you are connecting to God in, in a way that, um, that opens the conversation. Um, so I don't I, know I if you're that. aware of how revolutionary what you just said is. Uh, because certainly, uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for all of Christianity, <laughs> but for, for most of my Protestant experience, we say our prayer and then we say the Lord's Prayer. And I, I think your thought is amazing that it could be used to jumpstart our prayer, okay? Here's our template, here's our model prayer, we'll pray it together, and now we'll have our own prayer after that, whether it's our own church prayer or our own personal prayer. That's how it works for me. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I really like that idea uh, a lot. I think once again, we're being uh, reminded uh, that we're not alone. Um, you know, that's th th this whole idea of our Father who art in heaven, and, uh, you know, as we headed into the 21st century, a lot more discussion about uh, the use of, of gender pronouns in religious life and in prayer life. And so there's been debate about whether we talk to God as, as Father. And the, there's a story that, uh, uh, that I tell from my early experience as a pastor. We hosted a conference on uh, gender and religion. And one part of the conference was on the Lord's Prayer and whether we should change it or not. And one young woman said, I can't stand to say our Father who art in heaven because my father was abusive to me. And every time I say that, it hurts me. And sitting next to her was her dear friend. And her dear friend said, my father was also abusive and that's why I need to pray our Father who art in heaven. So here are two people sharing the same experience, sharing the same faith, but for one, that word was an awful trigger, and for one, it was a hopeful image. But whether we talk of God as mother, as father, as both, as a mixture, the idea that there is this loving figure, this parent-like figure that we can go to, at any time is still that that comforting power 
And I always invite the kids in my confirmation class to, to feel free to say, great love, our mother, whatever it is that establishes that connection right away for them. And uh, I think we are invited to do that by the many and um, beautiful ways in which God is present in our world. Uh, God is not limited to one image. Right. Uh, and I think yeah. we agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm taken by the fact that both in the 23rd Psalm and in the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And the Lord's Prayer says, give us our daily bread. Yeah. So in the 23rd Psalm, whatever you're up against, he, he calls it enemies, but it could be a pandemic, it could be any of life's issues that we face, whatever it is we're up against, that quiet confidence and serenity to sit down and have a table prepared for you. You know, biblically, I think the image is your enemies across the river, there's a battle scheduled for an hour from now, but you sit down in front of your tent uh, with a linen tablecloth and you sit down and have a hearty meal. And that sort of says to your enemy, you know, I'm not all that worried. I suppose so. Um, and, you know, that may not be the image for today. We, have, we, we can define enemy in lots of different ways, but still facing whatever it is that confronts us with that kind of confidence. And then going over to the Lord's Prayer where, and scholars a lot brighter than I have pointed out, these are demands. These aren't get, please, 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 please. This is give me my daily bread. Sure. You know, give me my forget. It's almost the sense that we have a right to go to God for certain things. And, and we have a right to our daily bread. I've been thinking, obviously, as we all are, about uh, the side effects, uh, the experiences, the lessons to be learned during this uh, coronavirus um, pandemic. And I think both of these verses help me because we're struggling to get enough masks for everybody, enough respirators for every, enough tests for everybody. The Bible seems to be saying to us two and three thousand years ago, there is enough for everybody. Uh, we may not distribute things fairly. Uh, we may hoard or we may not plan ahead, but there really is enough for everybody. Uh, our world can have enough masks. Our world can have enough respirators. And uh, my mind goes, uh, to Jesus' wonderful uh, miracle of feeding the 5,000. And uh, the Bible says, in, in one of the overlooked parts of that story, is they had everybody sit down in groups of 50 and 100. And everybody gets fed, and then everything is conserved. There's 12 baskets of leftovers. They begin with a few fish and a few loaves of bread, and when the whole thing is over, there's an abundance left over. Yeah. Right. And the, the part that's overlooked, I think, is Jesus had a plan in mind, an organizational plan. And it was probably in this very room here at the library at the church house where somebody said in, in the Bible study when we were looking at this scripture a couple of years ago that, you know, if, if there's 5,000 of you and you have food enough for yourself, uh, it's easy to be anonymous and eat that whole sandwich by yourself. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden you're broken up into a smaller group and there's somebody next to you with nothing to eat, Very you're probably going to share that sandwich yeah. or give maybe yeah. three people a piece. Yeah. Yeah. And that that may have been a part of Jesus' intention, but that, that organizational method and that idea that he took what was offered, not enough bread, not enough fish, didn't whine about it, gave thanks for it, distributed it fairly, and then the miracle that takes place is that there was enough. What's uh, other parts of, of the Lord's Prayer touch your heart? Oh my goodness, the sense of forgiveness in the midst of it and, uh, and the forgiveness that we owe to others is, uh, I mean, it's literally the central line of the prayer, but it, it also is um, central, I think, to the spirit in which we pray this prayer. Mm -hmm. that there are those things for which we need to be forgiven. There are those things for which we need to forgive others. 
and uh, one of the things that we did again in confirmation class was uh, we did a whole evening on prayer as, as you remember and, and one of the things that the kids did was to write down the things for which they needed to be forgiven and actually put it through a paper shredder as a reminder oh, that in okay. God's hands um, sins are taken away and uh, um, they, they were very touched by this. The, um, I think they also love putting paper in the paper shredder, to be perfectly honest, but, uh, but that's uh, central to this prayer is that sense that uh, whatever it is we've been that we need to let go of, um, God's, God's putting it through the shredder. Oh, I love and, that. Uh, and so that's a powerful reminder to me because it's needed each and every day, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. We're coming up on Easter. Yeah. Um, the promise of, of, of eternal life. You know, you think of that last week in, in Jesus' life, the joy of Palm Sunday, the wonderful triumph of Easter, but in between sadness, sorrow, betrayal, hurt, death, uncertainty. Uh, and that's very often, not just in the time of the coronavirus, but in, in, in life itself. Uh, you know, our, our church family, uh, among our church family, we suffered four deaths last weekend uh, and that's four families and extended families whose hearts are, are, are sorrowing, grief stricken uh, in, in the midst of their sorrow right now. And the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer both speak to that. Uh, the 23rd Psalm, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then the Lord's Prayer, especially what's called the Protestant ending to it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So both end with this idea that God's goodness, God's love, and God's long-term plan for all of us is greater than any sorrow, any grief, any loss. That's the, the ultimate promise to all of us. And we'll try to hold on to that. Any last-minute thoughts? Well, what a pleasure it has been to be in conversation with you. Well, we'll be back here <laughs> next week, and uh, okay. perhaps we'll return to the Gospel of John, or perhaps we'll uh, continue uh, just looking at scriptures that touch our hearts for this particular time. But we're certainly very grateful for all of you who are joining us um, online to be a part of our Bible study. Um, why don't we close with a word of prayer? Would you do that for us? Absolutely. Gracious God, thank you for your reminders every day of your nearness and your presence. Thank you for the reminder through scripture that there is no valley we walk through where you are not present with us, that there is no day in which you do not give us our daily bread, that which nourishes our spirits. Keep our eyes open always to your presence. Keep our hearts open one to another. In your son's name, amen. Amen. See you soon.